Now, the latest figures we had yesterday showed more than 50,000 new cases of coronavirus in the UK and another 981 people have died. There are now more people in hospital being treated with COVID-19 in England than there were at the peak of the first wave in April. Hugh Montgomery is Professor of Intensive Care Medicine at University College London and Clinical Counsel for the Intensive Care Society. Works in an intensive care unit in North London and uh, I think he's currently at work. How are things with you today there, Hugh? Um, not at all good, um, but that's nothing unusual for this morning. Um, we're, we're in a lot of trouble um, in UK intensive care now. What does that mean exactly? What does that look like? Um, just huge numbers coming in, um, huge numbers coming in. So, you know, my heart goes out as well to the emergency departments. I mean, our own one, but everyone else with whom I'm talking, the emergency departments are seeing the tsunami in the last week or two of cases. The wards are flooded. Um, everyone's working at maximum stretch, really. We've had to double up on or sometimes triple up on consultant staff in. Uh, the nursing staff are back to being very overstretched. In some areas, it's one ITU nurse to four patients again. Um, and the numbers are still rising. What kind of conditions then are people are coming in with? How are they presenting there? Uh, it's exactly the same. So this, this quotes new variants. We should be a bit clear on this. I mean, it's severity of illness caused by it is, is no worse or better than the first one. It's, it's not a, a, a nastier type of the virus. And its transmissibility is indeed a little bit higher but it's making me actually very angry now that people are laying the blame on the virus. And it's not the virus, it's people. People are not washing their hands. They're not keeping two metres distance. They're not wearing their masks. I've seen delivery people coming into this hospital in the last two days with no masks on, as if there's nothing happening here. This isn't the virus, this is people. People are not doing what they should be doing. Um, so we're seeing the same conditions. It's usually respiratory uh, as the presenting complaint uh, and then going on mounting levels of oxygen, going on to non-invasive ventilatory support and then doing what they did the last time, which is some of them get better and others just suddenly crump and end up on ventilators and die or survive. Um, and, and that's the exit. And the problem with this, of course, is that it takes people a long time to get better, even if they're on a ward. Uh, on non-invasive support, it can be a week to 10 days or more. Uh, once you're on a ventilator, it can be weeks or months before you're out. So we've got both taps wide open and the drainage from the bath is very small because the drainage is death or long survival. Uh, and the numbers are just mounting up. I know we've got to switch the taps off here. I know in the past you've talked about watching people who appear to be managing the virus and then having this very sudden deterioration and dying. Yeah, and Is that something that you still see? Yes, routinely. I mean, I went home to try to get a shower and stuff a couple of hours ago and I was called back in again at about half past four with someone exactly the same way, uh, someone who was pregnant who was managing just about and is not anymore managing. So this is, yeah, it's the same as it was first time around. The virus isn't different. And we should also be a bit clearer. There has been a lot of this myth out there that doctors now have new treatments. We don't. We've got one new intervention, which is a steroid, but you have to treat 100 people to save three to four admissions to intensive care. It, this isn't the big game changer, and there's nothing else that's new. We don't have any new treatments. That's the only thing we've got. So there's nothing out there that's, that's changed the, the landscape for us particularly. That patient, sorry, who, who, who you described there, who's pregnant, so we're talking about someone who's relatively young in that case. Yeah, and it's always been the way. There's this great myth that the hospital's just overwhelmed with demented 90-year-olds. But sad to say, that then those are not the people we have. Um, those people die because families and the patients have usually made decisions that intensive care or hospital admission would not be appropriate for them. So those are people who don't make it very often to hospital. So the ones who make it in are the people who have a chance of surviving with treatment and the selected ones who get to intensive care are the same because, very sadly, people who are elderly with multiple comorbidities wouldn't survive intensive care. So they don't get to us. So the people we're getting are indeed, as the first wave, really, lots of people of my age. I'm 58, um, and I would say half the patients on my own unit are younger than I am. And, you know, this that wouldn't be a, a, a particularly unusual age range, really. It's, it's middle-aged people who are a little bit older <clears throat> that we're getting. Gosh. 
Is this worse than it was back in April for you? Um, well, we're better set up. We know what we're getting now. We didn't understand the disease first time round, so at least we understand the disease, um, which we didn't before. We were getting blindsided every day first time round. We thought it was just going to be a lung problem, and then we realised it was a lung and kidney and liver and muscle and brain problem. Um, so at least we're not getting caught out anymore. Um, and the infrastructures are a little better. So in our own hospital, we were just, we'd ended up with two to three patients per bed. We've now got transport facilities in London. And a really, I have to say, the, the one good part about this, again, is just the extraordinarily wonderful people in the NHS. I just cannot tell you what a privilege it is to work with them. Um, everyone is polite and kind and helpful and cheerful. Um, we're moving patients around um, the most stretched hospitals are decanting to those that are a little less stretched. Um, but it can't keep going on like this in that I don't know at what point we're going to run out of capacity of ITU beds and indeed acute beds in London, um, if that will happen. Um, if it does, I guess they'll have to be decanting between cities, I'm guessing, that we'd have to start moving people around. But bear in mind, this is not something we do lightly. This is normally something we'd be penalised as a quality indicator for, is moving patients between hospitals when they didn't need to go for a specialist treatment. Um, but that's the situation we'll soon be in. We're already in that situation between hospitals in London, but we might soon be in it between cities, uh, of having to move people in ambulances because we've run out of beds where they could otherwise be treated. So my, my appeal again, I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely not an apologist for this or any other government or political parties, not a political statement. But the the problem here, I can't reiterate enough, is people. 50% um, or more of people will not even know they have this virus. They'll have such mild disease that they might not even know they've got symptoms and that they're spreading it. But this is very highly contagious. Each person can spread this to four to five people in an enclosed space. And each of those can spread it to four to five people. So one person can infect hundreds of thousands of people very easily. Um, people just have, I'm really sorry, I know it's horrible, I'm fed up to the back teeth with this virus too, and I want to see my friends and family and hug someone, but we can't, we just can't do this right now, so I'm really, really sorry that this New Year's Eve is going to be miserable, but it has to be. Please don't gather in masses, don't make this the last one song, don't give it a, well, it's all going to be locked down, so we'll have one more night out, because we can't have another spread of this. We're going to you know, it takes 10 days for someone who's infected to hit an intensive care unit. Um, so the ba bit bad behaviour that might have happened over Christmas, we're not going to see that until next week. And if people behave badly on New Year, we're not going to get that hitting us until the 8th or 10th of January. Um, so I just, my appeal is, I know it's horrible, but please just, it's hands face space. And part of that is not mixing with lots of people. How much time have you had off over this period? And how, how are you doing just generally yourself well i i'm all right i mean it's you know we're all you know i i can't complain um and i wouldn't we, we i chose this job and i'm i love doing my work and i'm you know people talk about the stress of work well the stress of having no job is far worse so my sympathy is with the people who have been made unemployed you alluded to that in your introduction the people whose jobs are uncertain whose businesses have gone under and those are the people for whom, you know, we, I don't deserve any sympathy at all. It, uh, the nursing staff do. They really, really overstretched. Um, it's the people without the jobs and so forth. And again, this is just something we've got to remember. We can't keep lurching between tier one, tier two, tier four. Um, if everyone just behaved themselves, life actually could carry on pretty reasonably. And we've seen that in other countries, Vietnam, Taiwan, places where people really, really, really just stick to the rules. They haven't had to have these massive national lockdowns. Their life continues pretty much as, you know, as normal, except that people keep the two-metre distances, always wear their masks, don't gather in large numbers, and alcohol gel their hands regularly. If we all did this, the schools could carry on, and we could carry on very much more normally. Um, it's because people suddenly lurch between, oh, I'm locked down to whoopee-doo, let's all cram into a bar. This is the problem. Mm. 
I'm, I know that you're under pressure to go. Are you all right? I've, a couple more questions, br just sure. briefly. Is that okay? Of course, yeah. I, I, I had a conversation with someone yesterday, and um, and he said to me, I talked about moving into tier four in our particular area, and mm. he kind of raised his eyes to the heavens, and I said, well, you know, nearly a thousand patients dying yesterday. Terrible news. And he said, well, you know, that's what they tell us. Um, it's 28 days within a test of positive test of COVID, but phew, that could mean anything. So well, what do you just, say I, to that person? Well, I, I just don't know what to say to these people. I was reflecting on this yesterday. I don't know whether this is... I just don't know whether this is a measure of the fact that people have become just utterly selfish or whether people are very, very poorly educated or whether people have lost the capacity to think and read good journalism and weigh evidence, or whether they can be bothered to do it. Because I don't know what they think people like me are doing. Are we meant to be making this up? Are we, is there some national conspiracy where every intensive care unit is locking its doors because actually there's no one in them? I, I fail to understand what this is. I suspect that it's actually... Um, selfishness actually that it gives people an excuse to carry on and it's unacceptable and before when this first happened in february i gave an interview for channel four where i said that people who behave like this have blood on their hands and they need to remember this and anyone who's listening to this who doesn't wear their mask who behaves like this they have blood on their hands they were they're spreading this virus other people will spread it and people will die they won't know they've killed people but they have um, and, you know, I, it's it's horrifying. We, you know, we're seeing whole families coming in now and I'm watching one parent, then another parent or a parent and a child die. You know, I'm watching whole families getting wiped out here. And it's got to stop.